This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. As um, more people become familiar with the uh, simulation tools that are available, that you will have to start relying on them more and more to be competitive at that level. What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Okay, we're back. Uh, this is Kevin again. Um, I've got a cool guest with me. Um, his name is Eric Likely. He works for Pratt & Miller. Um, and before we get started, I kind of wanted to go over something really quick. We have a, um, to remind people that we have a really cool community on Facebook called the Do It For Living community. Uh, this group provides insight and support from a lot of different shop owners. So there's several hundred uh, members on there, and there's a lot of questions and answers on there. Um, if anybody wants to join it, if you own a shop or are involved in the racing community, um, Request to join and be sure you look for a message from one of our admins so we can go over the uh, your involvement in the industry. And if you if you are actually involved in the industry, we'll let you in and then you can go ahead and participate. Uh, it's a really good place for you to get answers and to ask questions. So, um, and so okay, so we got Eric here. Uh, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm very good. So we've uh, Eric's a really busy guy. Um, he works for obviously, like I said, Pratt and Miller. Uh, he is a race engineer for the Cadillac. It's now ATSV race car team, right, Eric? Correct. Okay, and uh, so I've known Eric for quite a while. Um, he's been here. Uh, he went to school with me at UTA. Uh, we both did Formula SAE. Um, so I'm a little bit older than him, but he's obviously a lot more accomplished in the racing industry than me now. <laughs> I don't know about all that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you're, you're doing it professionally and uh, we just kind of do it for fun on the side, I guess. I guess I do it for a living, but, uh, it's not a, a professional race team. <laughs> so Eric, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself a little bit? Um, you know, like how'd you get involved? Give us your kind of like background and, in, in how you got involved with cars. Well, I think like a, a lot of people, my dad is what, who really got me into cars. Um, when I was younger, he would take me to the uh, the drag races and the local dirt track. We would watch the uh, demolition derby and the figure eight racing and all that fun stuff. Um, he had a dune buggy that he built from a Volkswagen bug. and We would bomb around the desert of Southern California. In. And uh, one thing that I remember in particular when I was young was uh, he took me to the Texas Motorplex after we'd moved to Texas to watch the NHRA drag racing. And um, I had... Uh, went up to the chain link fence that separates the racetrack from the spectator. And I kind of climbed up it so I could see over the top. Well, Tony Schumacher goes to make a run in his uh, top field dragster and just explodes at the eighth mile and oils down the track, makes a huge mess. And um, they start cleaning this up and an official walks up to me and I'm thinking, Oh man, I'm in trouble. You know, I'm sitting there, my eyes are watering from the nitro fumes, real nervous. And, uh, he walks up and he gives me this hot, greasy rag and it's just full of exploded connecting rod pieces. And, uh, I just thought that was the coolest thing. I was <laughs> so interested in race cars after that. And, um, when I was in high school, I was really into hot rods. My dad and I used to work on old cars and, um, I thought that I wanted to be a mechanic or maybe a fabricator at a hot rod shop. But uh, meanwhile, my mom was trying to steer me towards a career that actually required a degree and could make some more a reasonable living off of. And uh, she took me to a Formula SAE demo event at UTA. And um, I'd never seen a car like this before that was just a uh, tiny little autocross car with wings, a motorcycle engine. And I was just instantly hooked. And so I uh, started going to UTA for mechanical engineering. And it was a became really involved with the Formula SA program. I learned how to fabricate and weld and run a lathe and mill and um, pretty much everything you need to build a car from scratch and uh, started becoming more interested in road racing and autocross and Formula One and things like that. And um, while I was getting my degree, I was part of the design and build of five Formula SA cars and I was team captain and chief engineer and it just, uh, it really set the stage for what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I I knew that I really loved racing and, and wanted to do it. So I knew that Formula C was something special while I was part of it, but 
I didn't realize just how important it was until I started my professional career and um, all the things that I had learned from that program that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. You know, it taught me how to work on a team to solve complicated problems under tight deadlines. It taught me how to uh, manufacture and assemb assemble all the things that I could dream up. And then uh, after a few rounds of that, it taught me how to make things that are easier to manufacture and assemble because I had to do both sides of it at that point. <laughs> um, taught me how to deal with difficult people, taught me how to accept failure and learn from it, how to prioritize. And um, it was just a really powerful experience for the five years I was part of it. And um, it helped me get my job at the end too, because while I was at competition in 2010, it was um, in Detroit, it was my last year on the team. And one of the design judges asked for my resume and I didn't think much of it, but a few months later I got a call from Pratt Miller and they were looking for someone to work in the design office. So I went through the interview process there and took the job and uh, I packed up everything I could into a suitcase. I threw it into my old uh, 1973 Datsun and I drove up to Detroit from Dallas. And that was uh, kind of the start of my new life in Michigan. I did six months in the design office and I did suspension and steering system design for urban electric vehicles. And after that, I learned about an opening on the race team uh, the Cadillac racing program was just been resurrected with the uh, second generation of CTS VR. And I got that job and uh, became race engineer for Andy Pilgrim on the number eight CTS VR for the 2011 World Challenge season. And uh, the amount I learned during the first season in particular was just incredible. It was a trial by fire and I had no experience doing this professionally. So it was amazing to have Pratt Miller put their faith in me that I could figure it out and, and do a decent job. And uh, that car was really incredible. If you haven't seen it before, it's got a uh, an LS3 that idles like a top fuel dragster and just sounds awesome. And that thing really punched above its weight for its whole time it was run. We ran that car for four years and we won the Manufacturers and Drivers Championship three times, which is a pretty good hit rate. And uh, during that time period, World Challenge allowed standing starts and launch control, which was, was a really satisfying project to work on because <laughs> you have, uh, you've got an easy metric there. You know, what was your 60 foot time? You either did better or you didn't. You were not relying on driver feedback and uh, more ambiguous um, feedback loops. And uh, it was something we got really good at as well. Is there many all-wheel drive cars in the World Challenge? At that time, there was one all-wheel drive caller. It was the, uh, the Volvo, and uh, they were the ones to beat. They would always have such a big advantage off the line. So we really, we really had to work at our launch control. And um, when we got it working, it was pretty spectacular, and we were consistently gaining positions. Um, unfortunately, this season, they've gotten rid of launch control, which took out some of the fun. Um, <laughs> Well, at least some of, then, the, some of the engineering fun. It's probably more fun for the drivers, though, huh? <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. They really love those standing starts. Uh, Johnny O'Connell says there's not many things that are more exciting than uh, sitting at the light, you know, bouncing off the rev limiter and just ready to go. It's, uh, it's pretty stressful. It can go so wrong, and uh, you have no idea just what's going to happen. <laughs> I really would mix things up. So in... Um, 2014, we started the design of the uh, new ATS VR, which was a, a much different car. It was a V6 twin turbo, had a lot more aero, and it was built to uh, the FIA GT3 specification, which is a really big worldwide spec for uh, GT cars. And this requires you to homologate the car. Um, so what that means is you design and build it, and then you take it over to France, and they do testing on it, see how much power you've got and what your downforce and drag levels are. And then they kind of, it's all fixed from that point on. So it becomes a bit of a different problem is now all you've really got to work with is your setup. Um, you can't really make big advances. You can't change your suspension geometry and things like that and develop the car as the season goes on. You're just able to work on your dampers and how you utilize the tires. And so, um, it's uh, less scope to work in, but you have to be a lot more detail-oriented. You can't really make big gains. Um, so it's been a bit of a different challenge. But this car made its debut in the 2015 season, and uh, we won the Drivers' Championship, which was very satisfying because it was a very tough year for us. We had a lot of teething issues. We burnt down a car and just uh, had a lot of crashes and bad races, but we came out on top. So that was uh, 
pretty satisfying. A couple of questions. So do you still have the, the broken pieces of rod from the drag strip? I do, yeah. They're sitting <laughs> in a box in my closet, autographed oh. by Tony Schumacher. Awesome. Okay. And then what people don't realize is uh, how useful Formula SA really is. I think we mentioned it in a my podcast uh, in, in episode, I think, like 50 or 40 or something like that. But going into your experience with Formula SA, you did not know how to weld before that, did you? Or very little? No, I only knew how to do basic mechanic things going into it yeah and, and so you said you were like you were involved with your with your dad on hot rods and stuff and, and i had the same experience as you just slightly different but um you know like i did i did uh porsches and uh, i had my evo but you know you go into this thinking you know what you're doing in a formula say and immediately immediately you realize you're the bottom of the totem pole like you have no idea what you're doing and you know like I was going for my master's degree and they had me drilling or sharpening drill bits for the first day, right? Like that's, <laughs> that is literally the level of competency that people in this program have. And, you yep. know, you did it for five years and so you, you experienced it and you got to learn, you know, how to weld, how to draw stuff in SolidWorks, how to fit everything. You know, like this is not the typical, uh, um, what's the Facebook meme where like engineers know how to design stuff, but they don't know how to build cars that are, you can service. I don't, I've seen a lot of different memes exactly. related to that, but we, you understand that a car needs to be serviced very quickly as a race car designer, essentially. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, particularly in world challenge, but in really any series, you've got a fixed amount of practice time and it's so valuable. Your driver needs to learn the track and how the car handles and, you know, you need to make changes to it. And, uh, if you can make a uh, ten minute change take five minutes, that's a big deal. And, and you, so, you, as a race engineer, what is your actual role on the team? What do you do? Um, so my role as a race engineer is I basically manage my car and driver. So the way that the team is structured is uh, it's a two car program, and each car has a crew chief, two mechanics, and a race engineer. And then in between the shared between those two cars is a data system engineer, a halftime assistant for him, two truck drivers, and our program manager. So that kind of gives you some idea where I fit in there. Um, and then we also have a few engine guys that are provided by uh, GM propulsion systems. So my role is I set the direction for the crew. Like if uh, there's something in particularly that we need to work on, say we need to um, – practice a certain change so that it can be quicker in pit lane or um you know i want to improve whatever part of the car i kind of give them that direction but i'm not really their boss they are responsible the crew chief is responsible for the condition of the car that it's always reliable and well prepared and safe um so i set their direction by giving them a setup sheet for example or a session plan for when we are doing a private test or a, a practice day on a race weekend. I give them a plan that I tell them how many laps the car is going to run, what are we going to test, um, what are the probable changes, what the fuel load is, and that sort of thing. And then while we're out on track, I have to just talk with the driver. I tell him when to pit and what he's supposed to be doing. And then uh, I have to interpret his feedback, which is really kind of an art in and of itself that, uh, you know, you don't get to experience the car like they do as a race engineer. So everything you're getting is uh, what you interpret from them, which can make it difficult if you're not on the same page. Um, so and it's not always about what technically will make the car faster. It's what about and what enables your driver to go faster, what makes him more comfortable so he can drive closer to the limit so he can be confident making a pass or defending or, or whatever you need to do for that particular race. And then um, the other thing I have to do is make sure that the car is legal at all times. As an engineer, you're constantly trying to push it as close as you can, whether it's a minimum weight or a minimum ride height, things like that. And so I'm ultimately responsible for that car being legal when it goes across the scale pad in post-race tech, for example. Um, the other things I do is I work with my driver to uh, find a driving style change that he can make to go faster. With two cars and two different drivers, you know they're always doing something different, so you can compare them and see what's better, um, give them ideas on different things to try, and then they can go try it, and you can come back and review the data later and see what was the fastest way around that corner. 
Um, and then when we're back at the shop, I uh, do a lot of review of race data. We collect a really large amount of data, and so it can be kind of daunting to try and get answers from it. So I try and process that and just make it easier to understand. Pratt & Miller has software to help me do that, and I've got scripts that I've written myself in MATLAB to help me with certain tasks. Um, I also do a lot of simulation. We have uh, in-house LapSim where I can help come up with the setup we go to the track with. I can understand uh, the changes I make, what they might do to stability or lap time, things like that. So I have a kind of a somewhat of a matrix of decisions I can make based on how the car is handling and what we need to accomplish. Then I, I can also write various simulations and Simulink for launch control, traction control, things like that. Um, if I have a particular problem I need to solve. And then occasionally I do uh, mechanical design and analysis work, but that's a lot less frequent now that we have a homologated car. Okay. So you can't make design changes per se. <laughs> it's Not really. No, up. it's, it's just, if you've got a reliability problem or you can work on something for the next homologation, okay. but on the CTS VR, for example, that wasn't homologated. So there's a lot of places that we could try different things, different suspension geometry, take weight out of parts, things like that. Location obviously played a role in, in your job. You had to go from Dallas to Detroit, right? Correct. Okay. And have you ever kind of doubted yourself, um, you know, like when you had to move up there and, you know, the whole like racing, you know, everybody knows that racing is very like economy dependent, you know, so Cadillac at any second, would they pull out or, you know, like what kind of, what kind of a uh, thinking do you go through with uh, that kind of industry? Well, it was pretty terrifying moving up here at first because I was just leaving everything I knew behind, you know, I was fresh out of college and I just didn't know what to expect. Detroit honestly wasn't a place I really wanted to live that badly, but I wanted to work in racing and this was the opportunity that pre presented itself. Um, and then as far as job security goes, it's always kind of scary. Fortunately, Pratt & Miller has a lot of non-racing activities they do now to help uh, with those scenarios. Like the last recession, they started doing a lot more uh, military and commercial engineering services to help cover those lulls in motorsports. Diversified so, a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I'm reasonably confident if the uh, program were to get canceled, I would have something to do. But at the same time, uh, with the engineering degree, I know that if worse comes to worse, I can just do another engineering related job. And uh, I've got a lot of experience that while not immediately relevant, still shows the ability to uh, solve problems and make quick decisions and things like that. Yeah. And that's something that Formula SA is really exceptional. At. I think everybody in the indus industry, as, as far as engineering goes, uh, automotive engineering, that experience will get you basically anywhere you want to go. So, <laughs> yeah, I agree completely. And it's not even doesn't even have to be automobile or uh, motorsport related. It it still gives you uh, the knowledge to make parts and uh, and learn from your failures and things like that, which you may not get with a uh, a less hands-on extracurricular activity. Yeah, I, I heard through the grapevine that SpaceX goes to the FSAE design final stuff and they try to recruit out of there as well. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if there's any truth to that, but... <laughs> they do recruit heavily. It's like Formula SAE space. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so what's the worst experience you've had in you know your business or racing? Um, honestly, I, I can't think of a really worst experience. There's certainly some pretty rough times we've had. We've gone long stretches where you're away from home, you know, you've got a race and then a test and then another race or something like that, which can be difficult. There's times when the cars crashed heavily and you're up all night. Uh, the mechanics are up all night fixing it. You're there supporting them, trying to help where you can as an engineer. Um, or there's maybe there's something wrong with the car. It's handling weird and you just can't figure it out. You're having the mechanics look at various things. You're looking at data and you're just struggling to find this problem. All those things can be pretty difficult. But the great part about that is that, uh, you know, your competitors are not always your biggest challenge. And times like that are when you get to pull together as a team and it's the opportunity to triumph in the face of adversity, which is what I really like about motorsports. You know, these are the moments when you tackled an extremely difficult situation and succeeded that you can look back on fondly in the future. And, uh, you know, it's important not to get worked up about these uh, really bad times that may happen because uh, they just make the uh, good times that much sweeter, I think. Uh, excellent. Yeah, and that's actually something that a lot of people that 
you know, listen to this podcast can relate to is, is racing is not necessarily about racing your competitor. It's, it's, you know, fixing a problem or discovering something you didn't know before and learning from your experience. So exactly. A lot to be said from that. So tell us something right now that you're doing that, that has you fired up. Well, uh, the biggest thing right now is that uh, I've got a new driver for the season. His name's Michael Cooper, and uh, he's a young guy. He's been working up through the ranks. And uh, this is his first season running something that's a GT3 level performance. Beforehand, he had done the uh, Playboy MX5 Cup and the uh, Lower World Challenge classes, and uh, he's won a championship in all of them. And so it's really uh, personally satisfying to help him realize his potential in the car and continuously improve and every race weekend you can see him getting better and more comfortable and more confident in the car and uh it's a it's really challenging to figure out what exactly a new driver wants in the setup you know what does this feedback mean drivers can use uh really abstract terms like flop or pushy loose or just weird things like that that don't make engineering sense and so you have to figure out what that is that they're getting at and how to solve those particular problems. Um, and it's really, it's way more than just setting up a car. It's a constant experiment in driver psychology. You're trying to figure out, you know, what do I need to say to him or her to get them in the right state of mind before qualifying or before a race? Or, you know, what if they're on the pole for the race? Or what if they're in 10th place? You know, it's, you don't necessarily want them to have the same frame of mind in all of those scenarios. So it's trying to work those aspects as well. And it's a, it can be a pretty challenging problem and it's a, it's a lot of fun to work together and uh, become a really cohesive team because the uh, driver engineer relationship is just absolutely vital to having a successful program. And so it's something I, uh, I've been really excited about doing and uh, I've been learning a lot from. So I'm going to throw a curveball question in here. Uh, how right. how did you guys, how do you pick a driver and do you have any say in that since you're the one interacting with them? Yeah. So the way that uh, we pick a driver is it's not necessarily a hard and fast um, method, but we've got our eyes on particular people that we see in the lower classes or just even that we're competing against that that seem like they're fast and that they um, can stay out of trouble, that they can uh, race hard and, and fair and, and not beat up equipment too hard and things like that. So you constantly always have your eyes out for new candidates. And then we've had a couple of new driver tests where we grabbed a handful of new guys that we thought were promising, put them in the car and just ran through a basic test program to judge their feedback and how well they follow instructions and things like that. And then at the end of the day, it's just looking at all those results and and uh, making your best engineering judgment. It's not always the person who's the fastest in the car that you want. They've got to be a team player and uh, do all the other things well. So I definitely had a say in that because I was going to be the one working with him. And he was the one I picked. So I'm glad that GM agreed with my decision because it's been working out pretty well so far. Okay. So it, you're not the only one, but you are involved in the decision. <laughs> exactly. Okay, cool. Before we continue on, I wanted to take a second and tell everyone about My Shop Assist. If you own or work for a performance shop of any type, take some time to think about how organized and efficient your operation is. Our goal at Do It For a Living is to tell success stories in the industry and to educate you, the listener, on how to be successful in your business. My Shop Assist is a cloud-based shop management system developed to address the common shortcomings shops have. It enables you to track hours, pictures, notes, and even parts on every job at your shop. Manage your texts with the built-in calendar and assign tasks to them. The jobs can be exported to QuickBooks for accounting and billing. Customers can log in online and follow your progress on their car and digitally sign your work orders. MSA was designed to be simple to use and will help anyone from a one-man shop to the top performing shops in our industry. Check out the system for free at myshopassist.com. So moving on here, uh, we already kind of talked about you and your role within um, Pratt & Miller and the, the race team. Um, so how much time do you spend, you know, like working? I mean, are, are you doing a 40 hour week or does it, is it move beyond that? Well, it's, it really depends. I average 55 to 60 hours a week, uh, throughout a whole year. But when you're back at the office in between races and, uh, you know, it's a kind of a lull in the schedule, it can be pretty normal 45 hour a week or something like that. 
but uh, it is very easy to put in a hundred hour week when you're on a race weekend or testing or you're in the design phase of a new vehicle. So that sort of thing can make it pretty difficult to maintain a normal social life. But at the same time, when you've got a uh, cohesive team, you become friends with all the guys you're working with. So when you are traveling, you've got the opportunity just built in to go out and do things with them and uh, work a little bit of your social life into your job, which makes it nice. And, and do you have? Do you find it hard to have a personal life being on the road? Uh, no, it's not too bad. I mean, it, it's maybe not a completely normal personal life like uh, most people are used to, but it works for me. So – when you doubt yourself and think this isn't going to work, uh, how do you overcome that feeling and move forward? Well, that really depends what you're working on exactly. And uh, an important part is the answer to the question you asked there, what if this doesn't work? And uh, sometimes that doubt is really important to listen to because if the answer to that question is, if this doesn't work, someone could get hurt or killed, then you need to erase that doubt completely by double checking your work, having others check your work. You can't be afraid to ask for help if you need it in that scenario. So that's something that I think is really important is understanding the magnitude of what exactly you're working on and what the consequences can be. Um, you've got to be right in that sort of scenario. But there's a lot of things that are less critical. And in those cases, I just have to go back and ask myself, you know, did I use my best engineering judgment on this? Is my analysis sound? Can I test this before it goes on the car um, so that – if it fails, it's not as big of a deal. Um, or is there someone that I should ask that's done this before? And then there's things like setup changes on the track, which uh, those you're, you really just have to go with your gut. You've got maybe two minutes to make a decision based on what your driver's telling you. And uh, you just have to shoot from the hip and you know make the best educated guess you can with the information you've got. And many times it's wrong and you learn that uh, you need to go the other direction. So you call, call the car in again and make the change the other way and see what happens and learn from it. You know, it sucks when you go the wrong direction with the setup right before qualifying our race, but that's really the nature of the game here because you've got an extremely complex nonlinear dynamic system and uh, really incomplete information with work, which to work with. You know, uh, a good setup is really kind of a knife edge and you may be on either side of that and not know which way to go. So sometimes you just have to try something and see. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is, uh, what you're talking about always reminds me of, there was a race in Canada, a formula one race. Uh, um, it had to have been like maybe eight years ago, maybe longer. Uh, one of the Red Bull or one of the sister cars, um, they were trying to cut weight out of the, uh, front control arms, right? Cause obviously lighter, lighter weight control arms, um, makes the car lighter, makes your suspension, um, less, uh, unsprung mass on it and they kind of went a little too far and i don't remember if you remember this video but he hit the brakes on one of the long straights and literally both the front um control arms broke apart and the car yep. goes skidding straight into the sand pit and that's the kind of uh risk that and this is not like a driver error this is a engineering design error where they did not give themselves enough uh um you know error in the, uh, <laughs> the control arms there. I mean, they didn't give themselves enough, uh, um, strength. So it's just very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I definitely remember that. And, uh, yeah, I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so the pursuit of perfection, right? Exactly. Okay. So innovation is the name of game in, in racing. And, uh, so how much of what you guys comes from inside your brain trust versus like monkey see monkey do from other teams? Well, you're always trying to understand what your competition is doing. You know, you're at a race weekend or a test in particular, you're always keeping an eye out for what they're doing for lap times and uh, if you see anything new on the car. But nowadays, it's quite a bit different in the form of racing I do because everything is homologated. So if I see a new aero widget on the car, I know that they can't race it because it's not legal. So the... Uh, that changes the nature of it a little bit because you can look at how that other car is designed or, or something like that. And then you just kind of have to put it in your memory bank for the next time you design a car. It's like, does their solution help solve my packaging problem or, or whatever your issue may be at the time. Um, and I think that that is a, a lot different scenario when you're in formula one nowadays where 
you, if you do see something that someone else has done, you can try it for the next race and see if it works out for you, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that really depends on uh, what kind of racing you're doing. And now with the uh, homologated cars that are to built the GT3 specifications, all you can really do is work on your shock springs, camber toe. And so you can't really see what those guys are doing necessarily to, uh, to glean information from that. Okay, and so the the car you start with that is every year you're getting it homologated. Um, it's really up to the manufacturer. You can do it more like every two or three years. Sometimes it'll be um, an evolution update of just minor things that you can do on a, a yearly basis, and then uh, every couple of years you'll come out with a new model or or a bigger update or something like that. Okay, so Cadillac is really in charge of, they're kind of giving you the car to work with and then you have to work with their platform essentially. Exactly. Okay, so how has modeling and simulation kind of changed the path of racing? You know, you said you did a lot of MATLAB um, at your work. Uh, so how do you utilize that? And do you kind of see that technology filtering down? Because I know, you know, I did a lot of MATLAB in defense and, you know, I'm starting to see more and more of it even in like the, you know, amateur racing level. And, you know, like people are starting to use it to design shocks and use it for, uh, you know, data analysis. So how, how do you use it? Um, well, the modeling and simulation has definitely made a huge impact in racing. So one of the biggest things is it allows you to have much higher confidence when you design a car that your mechanical parts are strong enough that your uh, suspension members won't crash into other pieces or your fender liners or something like that that you've got uh, good kinematics with no bad behaviors. And uh, CFD allows you to narrow your focus a lot to designs with a high probability of success. And all of these things just really reduce the amount of testing you need to make sure you've got a good vehicle because track testing is extremely expensive. Um, but you can't just trust everything you come up with in the simulations. All of these things have to be verified. For example, uh, your suspension kinematics, you'll go to a kinematics and compliance testing rig, or uh, you'll do a seven post rig to work on your damper performance, a wind tunnel to check your aerodynamics. And oftentimes you'll find that what you simulated isn't exactly what you've got. So you've got to figure out why that is. You know, Usually it boils down to all the things that are difficult to simulate, like uh, compliance and friction and things like that, that you may not have baked into your simulation because it's just more detail than you need. So those are uh, the main points of it, I think, is just making sure that what you've got is, uh, is good before you start doing a lot of testing. You don't have to do a lot of iteration on your geometry or, or things like that. Um, and I think that a lot of this technology already has trickled down and uh, it's more so people just taking advantage of what's there. You know, the problem with things like MATLAB is it's just expensive for a license. And that's really probably not going to go down in the future. <laughs> so it's people being uh, aware of it and taking advantage of those things are finding free alternatives. Um, but you've got programs like SolidWorks that have a built-in FEA tools and CFD tools, which does make that very accessible. I think the biggest problem with that sort of thing is uh, not understanding its limitations. You still need a pretty solid engineering background to know how to do a proper FEA analysis of a part. You know, anyone can go in and make a, a pretty rainbow stress contour, but unless you are familiar with all the, uh, all the downfalls that can happen when something's missed, uh, you could be setting yourself up for failure. So you know, when I was in Formula SA, I used to think that having a, a proper lap simulation and tire data would give me all the answers and I would know what I needed to do. But in reality, it brings as many questions as it does answers. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, from experience, knowing those questions to ask does make you a better track engineer. <laughs> exactly. And I think it's a thing that you, you get with experience is just knowing what to ask and, and then how to answer it. Mm -hmm. And so you are using, you mentioned earlier that you're using uh, Simulink uh, models to simulate your launch control. Is that something you guys maybe auto code and put on your ECUs or are you using like uh, um, models from your ECU in your simulation at all? Well, 
Our, uh, our launch and traction control is actually a, a separate control module that we've done all the code on it. And it, it is built from Simulink. Okay. And, and that ECU, I guess, is, is since it's modulated, that's all set in stone. You don't get to pick your own ECU. Um, you do get to pick it, but then you cannot change it. Okay. So, you know, we have our engine ECU and our data logger and then our, our traction control computer. And those are all selected beforehand and homologated. And then the only thing you've got the ability to do after that is just work with your calibration values to try and make it better. Okay, so your engine crew of people can can make small tuning modifications then. Exactly. Okay. So as a tech you guys use filters down, you know, do you think, you know, people at the grassroots level are going to have to, you know, have engineering degrees to understand how to use these tools? Or do you think the tools kind of evolve to make them easier to use, you know, like wh what are the barriers of entry to get into racing? Are they going to get harder or do you think it's just going to get more technically advanced and not necessarily require, you know, the education? Um, I think that the, uh, the grassroots levels probably continue to get more technically advanced, though, honestly, I hope it doesn't because in reality, engineers have really ruined racing. <laughs> and uh, I kind of uh, long for the days where you could just show up with your car and win based just on your driver's skill. And I like to think that grassroots racing is the avenue where that still exists. But I do think that as um, more people become familiar with the uh, simulation tools that are available, that you will have to start relying on them more and more to be competitive at that level. Okay. Yeah, and I, you know, like I see, I do see a lot of uh, SolidWorks being used, um, even at the grassroots, I guess grassroots level. But like uh, the performance shops are starting to use it for design work because a lot of the OE cars are so much more complicated and well engineered straight out of the factory that there's not a lot of gains to be had. Um, and then obviously the software plays a more important role than just kind of winging it and going off experience. Um, it's kind of my take on what I do see. But um, so you guys are a professional race team. And so obviously you got to pay for this. You know, what are your guys' kind of primary sources of revenue and how critical is the role of sponsorship and like in how you personally dress and represent the team? You know, like how does that play into it? Well, we are a factory program for Cadillac. So it's definitely a little bit different than other race teams. And in our case, kind of like racing is where all of the funding comes from. You know, the, the marketing crew, they figure out where they want to race and what they want to race with and what the scope of the project is going to be. And then they, the uh, GM propulsion systems takes care of the engine side of things. And then Pratt Miller is contracted to build the car and run it. So in our case, we are not relying on external sponsors uh, like other teams would. And as far as uh, how being a professional team affects how we dress and represent ourselves, it definitely makes a difference. The biggest thing is that as a factory program, we cannot cheat. You know, a lot of teams, and, uh, you know, I certainly feel this way as an engineer, is you're trying to exploit the gray area in the rule book. You know, that's where you live or die, where you can find an advantage. Um, but as a factory team, you have to uh, take a lot more conservative approach to that um, because all of your hard work can be just erased if you are cheating and you get caught doing it. So that's a big thing that I've learned being part of a factory program is you don't even go there. You're conservative about where you're trying to push it on the rules, things like that. And then you always have to be professional. You know, you're at the end of the day, this is a marketing program. You're there to sell cars, even though it doesn't seem like that. When you're in the heat of battle, it seems a lot more noble, but that's what racing is all about. So you are uh, friendly with the fans, tell them about the car. And uh, really, if you can enjoy to do those things, it's a good time. And your racing is open pits? It is, yes. Okay, so anybody can go and check out the car and you know talk to you guys when you're, when you're working. That is correct. And honestly, I, I think it's pretty cool being able to interact with the fans and, and seeing how much they enjoy seeing the cars and, and what we've done with a uh, street Cadillac. <laughs> awesome. So does Cadillac bring like a street car to these events and set up displays and, you know, kind of show off the actual car? Like, I guess Absolutely. not the race car, but the street car? Absolutely. Yes. They, um, they've got a little display set up where you can get free t-shirts and look at the street cars and they can tell you all about them. And then we even have a uh, third race car that is uh, built and ready to go as a spare car if we need it, but it's on display at the marketing tent as well. So people can see the race car up close. 
Okay, so before we move on to the last couple questions about yourself, we wanted to pause. EFI University is hosting a new class called Essentials of Operating a Shop. If you're interested in learning how to run your shop more efficiently, this class is for you. For details and to find a class near you, go to EFI101.com and look for the Essentials of Operating a Shop class. Our next class is being held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on June 4th, followed by Denver, Colorado on July 16th. Be sure to use the coupon code DIFAL for $50 off when you sign up. So do you have any, like, do you have a one-year or a five-year goal with uh, Pratt & Miller? Uh, yeah, my I have a one-year goal, and that's uh, I really want to win a driver's championship this year with my new driver. Um, other than that, though, I don't have any well-defined major goals beyond that. I'm uh, I'm pretty proud of myself since I've done a great job in checking a bunch of things off my goal list. And so now I'm kind of at the point where that list has gotten short, and uh, it's time for me to figure out what's next. And, and I'm assuming Pratt & Miller, since it's a big company, has a lot of room for growth. <laughs> uh, they do, yes. So, cool. So we like to take action on Do It For a Living. Can you suggest an action item to our listeners that they can take to improve their situation? Yeah, this may be um, a bit unconventional, but it took me a number of years to realize how important it is to have a reasonable work-life balance. So my suggestion would be to Take some time to yourself, relax, and then get back to it with renewed focus. In a in an industry like racing, it's really easy to burn yourself out. You know, you can be working overnighters, multiple ones in a row, hundred hour weeks, and just trying to meet your deadlines, get your car ready for the race, whatever. And like we talked about before, that can be really satisfying. But at the end of the day, there's more to life to that, and so uh, it's important to have good balance. Okay, so we got some quick answer questions. What software program are you using daily? The program that I probably use the most is called Pi Toolbox. That is the uh, data analysis software we use that works with all the data acquisition, data acquisition systems on the car. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like we talked about, just analyzing race data, trying to learn from all the data you've collected and, uh, and make a better setup for next time. Is that the stuff that's on your pit wall? You have computer screens on the pit wall? Yes. Uh, do you have a favorite app that you use daily? And this does not have to be even anything automotive related. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the one I use the most is a mint.com app. I love tracking my finances and uh, trying to spend less, be more frugal so I can enjoy the things I want to enjoy. Cool. And what are you driving right now? Currently, I'm driving a uh, 2004 Audi S4 Avant. Oh, Cadillac hasn't given you a car yet? Man, I would <laughs> love to have a CTSV or an ATSV, but... They're a little bit out of the uh, price range <laughs> that a race engineer can afford. <laughs> okay. Uh, and where do you see the automotive, uh, the future of automotive performance being? I think this is completely electric cars. When I was in the design office, I spent some time working on small urban electric vehicles. And um, it was pretty amazing what you could do with them. And I think that the current generation of performance cars, whether they're combustion, hybrid, or electric – have shown us that the manufacturers are going to keep advancing this technology to improve efficiency and range, but at the same time, they're going to keep making cars faster and more fun to drive. And so I think that as more cars become fully electric, you're going to see them take advantage of the ability to do torque vectoring um, and to improve how ABS and traction control, stability control, and things like that function. You know, you've got a way faster response than uh, making a torque change via your combustion engine or through your hydro hydraulic brakes, for example. And what this will allow you to do is make the car more predictable at the limits and allow you to just drive close to the limit all the time when you want to. And it's just going to make things uh, more fun to drive and more efficient at the same time. So do you see a time here in the near future where uh, Tesla may come to you guys and ask you to make a uh, GT3 Model S? <laughs> well, that would be pretty cool. But at the moment, we are completely GM. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully, GM would do that soon. <laughs> okay. And so how do we connect with you know your team or yourself? Well, the best way is if you uh, come to any of the Pirelli World Challenge races, just stop by uh, the Cadillac Racing Trailer and say hi. But in lieu of that, you can watch our races online at www.world-challenge.com. Awesome. Eric, I want to thank you for uh, taking uh, some time out of your day to uh, talk to us. Um, I know we've tried to reschedule this several times. It's really hard to do these sometimes. But uh, <laughs> thanks again for uh, spending some time with us. No problem. It's been a pleasure. 
thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website, doitforaliving.net. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash doitforaliving and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button.